Hello and welcome, all you fellow time travellers. It's so wonderful, and I mean that, to have you with me, to have you with Paul and I as we continue our journey through a million years of history, British history. Ancient footprints, stone axes, all manner of clues, secrets, forgotten languages, symbols, all of it enfolded in a magnificent natural landscape. Neolithic monuments that are still empowered somehow to wow the world. Battles and bloodshed, the pain of which never really goes away. Royalty, revenge, war and war and war again. Tenderness, genius, inspiration. It's a journey, it's a drama, it's a story, and all of it is written on a set of islands, tiny scraps of dry land when you get right down to it, somehow imbued with heart-stopping beauty. And there's more to come, uh, but before the next stop, I just want to say again a huge thanks to everyone who signed up to my Patreon site. Um, it's your help and support. It's by subscribing to that Patreon uh, channel. Uh, it's that which enables this podcast to be and to keep on going. So th thank you for your support. If you're not a member yet of the family of Time Travellers and you want to join, go to patreon.com, look for me by name, Neil Oliver. Um, I promise at least one thought-provoking, I hope thought-provoking video every week. Now it's time for the next episode of my love letter to the British Isles. So strap yourself into the time machine and cue the music. And maybe he was a significant player when the finishing touches were being put to Stonehenge. And then when he died, he was, he was buried with great wealth. In this week's podcast, we follow in the footsteps of a man who, four and a half thousand years ago, walked across Europe, right into the history of the British Isles. A man of great status, buried with extraordinary care and ceremony, surrounded by gold, precious metals, beautiful flint arrowheads and fine archer's wrist guards. The richest Bronze Age burial ever discovered in Britain. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver and this is my love letter to the British Isles. In the last podcast, you took us to Silbury Hill in Wiltshire, the largest artificial prehistoric mound in Europe. Where are we this week? In this instance, the destination's not a place as such, it's a person. In fact, it's what I call a time traveller, who made the leap from the early Bronze Age to the 21st century, and he's called the Amesbury Archer. It was in 2002 and uh, builders and developers were working on a site uh, where they were going to raise some new houses and also a school, uh, a primary school. And as is the, as is the custom, uh, archaeologists went in and had a look at the patch of green field to see if there was anything there. It was already known locally uh, and on the Ordnance Survey maps that there was a Roman cemetery in that, in that locale. Uh, a place where Roman people had, had been burying their dead 2,000 years ago, let's say. Uh, but a, a cursory, kind of just using the human eye survey of the area, but what was noticed uh, were two depressions in the ground. And it, it was thought possible, before anybody dug any holes, that they might be what you call root bowls, which is to say when a big tree eventually falls over, maybe in a storm, it, it can lift out a great big plug of earth along with its roots. And when the tree's gone and everything, it, it can still leave this hollow in the ground. So sometimes it could, be, it could have been natural. 
Uh, but the first one and then eventually the other were excavated and what they found were burials that had been made four and a half thousand years ago. Wow. A time frame that overlapped with the, the late stages of Stonehenge. Uh, so this person was had died and was buried while the great trilithons of Stonehenge were in the process of being raised. Those great big, you know, the two uprights and then the, the lintel, big doorways, those great big stone doorways uh, were being raised at the time that this individual was alive and, and died. And so he was known, obviously, he was something to do with Amesbury, but he's called the Amesbury Archer because of certain things that were found in the grave with him. Uh, Amesbury Archer was a, was a title that the, the media latched onto very happily, sounded good, the Amesbury Archer. Uh, nothing to do with the Radio 4 programme, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but rather because he was found with 16 flint arrowheads had been had been buried with him, and also two uh, things called wrist guards. Uh, if you're if you're in the habit of using a, a bow, a long bow, when you draw it and release the string, uh, it, the string can bounce off your forearm painfully, uh, and if that keeps happening, you know you end up, you know, marked. It'll cut your cut your skin. And so archers quite often would wear a guard on their forearm. And in this instance, there were two of them in the burial with them. And so the presence of the, of the arrowheads, he was probably buried with a quiver of arrows and a bow. But all of that's organic material, that's all made of wood and uh, maybe animal gut and whatever. And that had all gone. And the shafts of the arrowheads, so all that was found was the stone arrowheads and also the stone wrist guards. But he, he probably went into the ground with all the paraphernalia of an archer. So, Amesbury Archer, but he was a, an extremely unusual and headline-grabbing discovery for, for many other reasons besides. He, he is, to put it simply, the, he's the richest early burial found so far in Britain. Someone from four and a half thousand years ago, he was buried with metal. And at that time, still the Neolithic the Stonehenge is associated primarily with the Neolithic, you would say. Uh, but by the by the end, when Stonehenge was coming to the end of its natural life, there were there were obviously people in its vicinity, people in Britain who had some mastery over making metal. So the next big revolution was already at hand. You know, farming itself had been a big revolution, but now, latterly in the life of Stonehenge, there were people who could make and use metal. And what the Amesbury Archer was found with, so as, as well as the arrows and the, presumably a, a bow and his wrist guards, he was found with three knives made of copper. Little little copper knives, small. If you picture really the size of a pen knife, that sort of size, but just copper blades. And also two gold ornaments. Uh, they're analysed and understood as things you would wear as decoration in your hair. So maybe someone with long hair, maybe the guy had long hair, and they're like, um, they're very thin. They're almost like foil. You would almost say they're like gold paper that you would wrap around a, a chocolate. They're, they're not quite that thin, but they're very thin. I've held, I've held one in my hand. And I can remember being terribly nervous in case I kind of twitched or flinched and I might have crushed it because it, it, it just have gone flat. And they're curved uh, as though you would have like maybe taken like a, a pleat in your hair and you would have used these as a decoration in your hair. Well, he was found with two of these. So three copper knives and two pieces of gold jewellery, ornamental gold jewellery. He was also buried with five beakers, uh, which are clay pots uh, that are known all across Europe and in Britain. You find them in graves uh, and they're about the size of a pint mug made of clay usually decorated, you know, with wrapping string around them and taking it off so it leaves an impression or, or maybe uh, scratching in, you know, geometrical shapes. You know, they're, they're decorative items. Uh, archaeologists think they were probably to do with drinking. The five may have gone into the ground full of a kind of a beer, for all we know, but obviously along with everything else, there was no liquid in the, in the beakers. Perhaps, perhaps he was surrounded by, by drinks of some kind when he went into the ground. He's a gift that keeps on giving. You know, found with so much stuff. Uh, and uh, the, the beakers all across Europe and into the British Isles are also associated with early metalworking. It's all bound up with a, with, with a, a, new, a new approach to life. 
you know, people who have mastered metal and they've got, they've got other things going on. Sometimes archaeologists talk about the beaker culture as though the people who used these cups, these, these beakers, uh, were kind of united across Europe, a, a whole culture. Culture is another of archaeology's C words that, you know, be, along with civilization and culture, people get a bit nervous when you start talking about cultures unifying people. But nonetheless, there's, there's talk of a, a beaker culture. So, so this individual, the Amesbury Archer, is, is a fascinating discovery because, of course, all the great wealth that he went into the ground with makes you say, who is he? Who is he? Uh, and you can imagine, perhaps, the impression that he would have made upon people who were, in the main, still used to using stone for tools, making flint tools to get sharp edges. To have someone among you who can show you metal would be quite the thing. Someone, that could, someone who could take something that looks solid and then melt it over a fire, like butter, turn it into liquid, and then maybe pour it into a mould and watch it go hard again. That's magic. That'd be magical. Imagine if you'd never seen that done. What a, what a conjuring trick that would appear. Uh, so we had copper knives. Copper's actually quite hopeless as a knife. It's too soft. If you've got a copper knife and you, and you carefully put a sharp edge on it, if you use that a couple of times to cut wood or anything else, it, it'd just go dull again. So and in, in many ways, a flint knife would have still been more useful to you as a tool but it would have had great kudos being seen to have something made of this new material. And really, that's not an end of it either. His grave was lined as well. He'd been buried... At, when they had dug his grave, they had lined uh, the edges of it with wood so that he was almost in a wooden coffin. Wow. But rather than actually being in a wooden box that got lowered into the ground like a coffin, uh, it, it was more the case that they, the people dug a hole, a, a rectangular hole, and then they, they lined the edges of it with wood so that he went into something very neat and tidy. Uh, he was buried in the custom of the time, which was lying on his side, on his left-hand side, with his knees pulled up to his chest, so curled in what we call the fetal position, curled like, a, like an infant is in the womb. Uh, and people were often buried like that. And it's very affecting when you see it. I mean, we're used to the idea of people being laid out flat on their backs, you know, arms by their sides or maybe crossed over their chests in this Christian fashion. But for a long time, people were buried, curled up. And it's very affecting when you see it because it suggests someone who's asleep. It has the look of someone who's sleeping. And if you think about them when they were still flesh, you know, when it was still a body rather than a skeleton, it would be quite very moving to see a loved one go into the ground curled up like that because it's a posture that suggests sleep. And it almost, it almost implies that people are maybe thinking about that person waking up. Maybe waking up in the next world. Which also explains why he goes in with beakers and his arrows for hunting, and his, his wrist guards and his knives. The suggestion is of the people who you left behind were expecting him to go somewhere where he would need things, and that death was being interpreted as a sleep, a pause, and that he would, or his soul would awaken again in another world where he would still need his gear. So it, it, and it's moving to think of, obviously, people thinking in those ways. What he has given us, it's just a list that goes on and on, uh, he was born with a deformity, I suppose you would say, uh, in his feet. Uh, but it wouldn't have been anything that he was aware of in life. It was a very mild deformity, but some of the bones of his insteps, which are in most people, you and me probably, are disarticulated. You know, bones that are separate from one another. Well, in him, in, Am in Amesbury Archer, the bones were fused. They were, they were fixed. So he wouldn't have he would have been able to walk and function normally, and he wouldn't have known there was anything different about him. But it's a it's a genetic abnormality uh, that he had. Uh, there was analysis done on the teeth in his jaws, uh, and uh, specialists were able to uh, identify where he had spent his childhood. Uh, because when when you're a baby and then a, a little person and a child, as you're eating and drinking, wherever you are. Your body acquires uh, the elements that are in the food and the water that you drink and eat. 
and it becomes part of you. You know, you turn the food that you eat into yourself. And we could tell that uh, from the elements that he had acquired that had become part of his teeth enamel as an adult, that he, he didn't grow up in Wiltshire. He grew up maybe a thousand miles away, somewhere south of the Alps. So whoever he was, he had come to Stonehenge as a grown-up. So we've spoken before about the idea of people being attracted to the British Isles because of the things that were here. Places, special places like the Ness of Brodgar in Orkney, like Avebury, like Stonehenge. Well, in the case of the Amesbury Archer, we seem to have proof of someone coming from far away to get to Stonehenge. And he lived out the rest of his life and was buried almost within sight of Stonehenge, just just close by uh, Stonehenge, a, a walk away. Uh, so it, it, it does make you think, you know, maybe was Stonehenge, as, as we expect, was it famous? And were people drawn to it? So people have always come to the British Isles. From the, from, you know, from, the, from the time of the hunters, people have been drawn. And as time went on, they weren't just following the herds, they weren't just coming after the animals, they were coming to see places. And so, and so the Amesbury Archer, it, it seems safe to say that wherever he was born and grew up, he knew about Stonehenge and he sought it out. And having come, he decided to stay. In adulthood, he had very badly damaged his left leg. He'd suffered an injury of some kind that, that took away his kneecap. You know, something hit him, or he fell, or, or some kind of terrible injury, but his kneecap was gone, and it never properly healed. Uh, it was a kind of a weeping wound. It would have, had, it would have had, had given off a bad smell, uh, and it would have caused him constant pain. And he probably walked with a crutch or a stick, you know, to help him stay upright. And also, finally, he had an abscess on one of his teeth, so, for a long time before he died, he'd had an, and anyone who's had an abscess, you know how agonisingly painful that is if you can't treat it. Uh, so he lived and died with a wound to his leg and with an abscess on his tooth. You, also, you can't help thinking that perhaps, in just the way that people went, still go to places like Lourdes in hope of cures, was he, had, he, had he come to Stonehenge in the hope that the magic of the place would cure him of his ills? Well... They didn't, and he went into the he went into the ground with the same uh, wound and the same pain that he'd that he'd had for a long period of time. I mentioned at the beginning that there were two depressions in the ground that might have been where trees had blown over but turned out to be graves. Well, his was one, and when the second was excavated, it was another burial, another man, a younger man. Uh, the, the Amesbury Archer was fully a mature adult. You know, maybe you know, maybe some in their forties, fifties when they died, but the other uh, burial was of somebody slightly younger. But crucially, he was found to have the same abnormality of his feet, and because it's so unusual, he's certainly born of the Amesbury Archer. So it's his, it's let's say it's his son. So the Amesbury Archer arrived alone or maybe accompanied by people and then he had a family or at least one son and the analysis of the other young man's teeth showed that he had grown up in Wiltshire in the vicinity of Stonehenge. So unlike his father, he was born and grew up in the vicinity of Stonehenge. His grave wasn't as richly furnished uh, but there, there were two pieces of gold jewellery for decorating hair uh, in his case, where they were found in, in his grave, it, it looked as though they may well have been put in his mouth. They may have been put in his mouth when he was put into the ground, or they might have been on a string around his neck, but they were, they were found in the vicinity of his head. So they may have, like, his, the people may have popped the two pieces of jewellery into his mouth so that he would have them, have them safe when he, when he woke up in the, in the next world. So, so these two figures, they, 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 they pose more questions than they could ever answer. You know, you've got this man with his bad leg and his bad tooth. He's born and raised somewhere south of the Alps, probably. In his adulthood, he makes the pilgrimage to the place that is Stonehenge. Uh, and he has a family there and lives out the rest of his life. 
his living and dying overlaps with the late stage of Stonehenge. So he was there possibly while people were raising those great trilithons. And the, the wealth with which he went into the ground has, has allowed some people to speculate that maybe he was a, someone of great significance. There were some stories in the newspapers at the time that they called him the King of Stonehenge, as though he might have been somebody who, after he arrived, he, he may have risen to prominence. You know, and maybe he was a significant player when the finishing touches were being put to Stonehenge. And then when he died, he was, he was buried with great wealth. But, but really, more than anything else, he's just a demonstration of, of the gravitational pull of the British Isles. We know now, now in the 21st century, we're a very popular destination. You know, there's, there's one of every kind of person in Britain by now. People come from everywhere. People of every creed and colour, every, every religious faith, they come to Britain in the 21st century. And it's quite instructive to realise that we've always been a destination for people from far away for different reasons. You know, maybe people come here now because of the economy and because of the, the freedoms and the rule of law and the, and the level of tolerant civilization that's here are understandable attractions in the 21st century. But four and a half thousand years ago, obviously there, there were ideas and, and places here that were enough to motivate folk from a thousand miles away to walk. Remember, the Amesbury Archer walked here you know, he came. He came on foot from wherever he from wherever he uh, departed. Uh, it was Shanks's pony. It was his own two feet that brought him here. It's incredible that people, even as far back as the Bronze Age, were prepared to relocate across large distances. Yes, I mean that's important to make that point. There have always been some people who travel. I suppose most people, even now with jet planes and all the rest of it, most people live out most of their lives at home. Maybe they move from one city to another and a very small minority of people would go and live and die overseas. You know, most people live out their lives here. Uh, but just that, that, but people are always on the move. I think, the, the, you know, the, the United Nations, I think, estimates that there's about a billion people on the move at any given time. They're away from home. They're either moving within their own country, within their own country, or they're moving between countries. But it's one in seven human beings alive today are on the move, happily or unhappily, maybe driven out by unrest or war or famine or whatever. All economic reasons, people you know, move in hope of a better life one way or the other. People are on the move. Uh, and it's been part of the story of humankind. Really, we can't seem to get ourselves to a point where people weren't mobile. And uh, and for the longest time, it, it was pedestrians. <laughs> it's people walking. For the archer to get here, it would have been a big, difficult journey, wouldn't it? You'd have to have reasons. But the the Amesbury archer, he's so he's such a concentration of wonder. I mean. If you think about it, it, after four and a half thousand years, it's remarkable that, that any part of you has survived at all. I mean, that's the, the fact that his skeleton, a skeleton is still there after four and a half thousand years. It's pretty remarkable. Uh, but also, he's buried with all this finery. And so, so instantly you're able, in your mind's eye, to conjure up the funeral scene. The grave was, the grave was dug uh, and then it was carefully lined with timber to make it more respectful, I suppose, more status. And then the man himself was was brought forth and laid down, you know, in the in the ground. Maybe he was bound up. He would have been fully dressed for sure. You know, we just find the bones. But imagine someone who's wearing his clothes, maybe maybe his best clothes, uh, and to be in that position. Either he was just moved into that position in the ground, or he may have been bound up, you know, wrapped in a wrapped in a, a shroud, to, like a cocoon, almost like a chrysalis, you know, like like a pupa that turns into a butterfly. You know, he may have been sort of bound up tightly, so that he was in that position, and then he's that, so he, the body's laid down in the ground, and 
it was probably, you know, maybe his, maybe his decorative stuff was on him, you know, his gold jewellery, uh, his copper knives close by him, you know, in the windings or in his clothes. And then the one of the wrist guards, one of the archery wrist guards was, 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 was on his arm that would appear from where it was found. Another one was positioned by his knees where they were drawn up to his chest. Then you've got the bow and and his arrows in their quiver probably laid down on top of him. And then around him were laid uh, the five beakers with f- liquid in them or not. We don't know. They were carefully positioned around his head and behind his back and at his, you know, at his legs. He was also, I don't think I've mentioned already, he also had a, a ring made of shale, which is a kind of stone. Uh, and the size of it and its position, it was probably, possibly, for fastening a belt around his waist. So think of, think of all, the, all the fuss that people have gone to. And then, and furthermore, to consign something like gold to the ground... That's uh, a mark of great respect. And then, obviously, the people that witnessed the burial would have known the gold was there. And they would have known the copper was there. And indeed the bow and the arrows and all the rest of it. But no one desecrated the grave. It was left intact. After four and a half thousand years, to find all of that and to be invited as people of the 21st century, to speculate about him is so lucky, you know, to be given so much of a glimpse of the way people were living and thinking and dying and how they were treated in death four and a half thousand years ago is just extraordinary. And when I saw him, him, he was in, he was on display in uh, the museum in Salisbury, which is the town close by to where he was found. And he was laid out in a white box under glass, with all the with all these finery ar- around him, and some people feel strangely about that. The idea of making a display of the dead. You know, there are people who, for religious reasons or moral reasons, uh, would take issue with doing that. You know, you would say you wouldn't do that with somebody who died yesterday, would you? You know, you wouldn't take one of our people and put them on display. So why would you take someone just because? They're four and a half thousand years old. Why is it is it right to put them on display like that? And obviously, there are some people for all sorts of reasons who would say it's wrong. And of course, the people who thought of his funeral and enacted his funeral and buried him in that way, they obviously had it in mind that he was going somewhere because they were preparing for a journey, and they probably weren't imagining that he was going to a glass box in a museum. So we definitely we have definitely compromised the intentions of the people that treated him so carefully four and a half thousand years ago. But for me, I was only amazed by him. And when I looked at him, I just saw a time traveller. You know, I saw I saw Doctor Who. In one moment, he went into the ground at, at a time when you could still hear the the banging and clattering from Stonehenge. And then, in the blink of an eye, here he is in the 21st century with so much to tell us. He he arrives among us like a messenger from another time. He brings the world of Stonehenge with him in his little TARDIS. It, It all comes with him. You know, if you've only got places like Stonehenge, and Stonehenge is remarkable. Avebury is remarkable, Silbury Hill is remarkable, but they're, they're piles of stone when you get right down to it. And to come across a person is by orders of magnitude more affecting because these places, Stonehenge, Avebury, Silbury, they were made by people. They were thought up by people. You're looking at ideas and thinking made manifest, made real well, to find someone like the Amesbury Archer, whose dates coincide with with the finishing touches, that means we've got one. We've got one of those people. We've got two. We've got his son. And they have so much to say. You know, and they tell us that whatever 
whatever Stonehenge was, I always amongst the things that I, I wish most intensely with all my heart is that I'd love to hear the sound of the name that they gave it. We call it Stonehenge, as though that's its name, but it's not its name. That's just what we call it. You know, that place must have been referred to in some way with a word or a group of words. I don't know what they are, but whatever that word or, or, or phrase was by which it was known, he heard it. It, it. Where he was, a thousand miles away, people had talked of it. And he heard people talking at some point and said, what's that? What are you talking about? And they said, well, there's this place. There's this place where people have raised these stones and, and they gather there and they do this and they do that. And on account of what they do, this happens. And he was, he was motivated to start moving. Now, maybe he was already lame and came in hopes of a cure. Or maybe he came to Stonehenge fit and well and was, was injured. You know, there's dangerous times for people. There's no medicine, there's no, there's no hospitals, there's no, you know, and people would be hurt in all manner of ways. So maybe he took the injury then. And then he got a bad tooth and he had constant pain. And then eventually, he didn't die of either of those things. It was, well, it's possible, I suppose, but uh, in all likelihood, he maybe just died of old age. And then everything else happened. And four and a half thousand years later, we get him. And he tells us all that. And it's profound, and it's, it's why in the story of the British Isles, I've included some people, you know, as destinations. Uh, and if you want to go and see the Amesbury Archer, you know, he's no longer in his grave, obviously. You go to Salisbury Museum and there he is. And, you know, there's every reason to imagine that that's where he will stay. We call him the Archer because he was found with arrowheads and wrist guards. But is it possible to work out from his skeleton if, in fact, he was an archer? Ah, uh, you're thinking about the famous archers of Agincourt and such like. Because to work a longbow, it's a huge amount of strength required, really. You, you or I would, would be hopeless. The, the draw weight on a, on a, on a warbow of the sort that was used at Agincourt, you're talking maybe a hundred pounds of, of draw weight to, to pull that string back to get any kind of useful action out of the bow. And they practice from boyhood with smaller bows, obviously, when they were five and six and seven years old, but they practised daily and weekly for the whole of their lives. And by the time they were taking part in battles, you know, they had been pulling on a, on a, on a war bow for decades. And it, it meant that they were asymmetrical, let's say, these guys. You'd have seen them coming onto the battlefield. Uh-oh, here come the archers. <laughs> these guys would have come, you know, all, all big on one side. Uh, and so, no, I, I don't think that when, when we call him an archer, uh, he may have he may have used a bow. People would have been hunting, but archers became shaped like that because they were practicing and using. He doesn't show that extent. He's called the Amesbury archer because of the arrowheads uh, and the wrist guards that show that he he was in the custom of using it. Incidentally, that. Um, the famous line from uh, Henry V in the soliloquy that the, that the king gives will strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Archers, uh, because of the repeated use of the, of the string, would have had scars across their forearms. So the, the, the wounds they're talking about stripping their sleeves and showing are the marks of an archer, uh, of a lifetime's use of the bow. So that's what the, that's what the guard is there for. But like so much else, we can't know for certain. Perhaps a bow was a mark of status. Uh, you know, he may have been too... Maybe he didn't have to go and do his own hunting. Maybe he held such a position in the society of which he was a part that he would have been able to count on being given food. Uh, and the fact that there's a bow and arrows and wrist guards in his grave with them, it may just be a bit like giving them, putting them in the ground with a sword or... It's a, it's a mark of who he was and the status that he held. You know, he may not have been someone who day in and day out was drawing a bowstring and, and shooting arrows. 
It's remarkable that this incredible history is still beneath our feet, just waiting to be discovered. And it's still the amazing thing. The amazing thing is it keeps happening, and it'll always it'll always happen. We'll, we will never have found it all. A point that illustrates that is, you know, obviously when we people go to the battlefields of the First World War, you know, to, to the Somme and to Verdun and, uh, you know, and the places the, the, where the terrible battles took place. Uh, and that's a hundred more than 100 years ago now. Uh, but if you walk over the ploughed fields today, any day, you'll find spent bullets, cartridge cases and other metal shell fragments, and that will go on for hundreds of years to come because of the sheer volume of, of ordnance that was discharged in those places. It's an extreme example. And similarly with the Second World War, where, where, where there were firefights involving shells and bullets, you still find it to this day and always will. The First World War was four years. The Second World War was six years. The past has been accumulating for tens of thousands of years human-made things were going into the ground every day, every week, every year for thousands of years. Uh, and some of it because of the conditions in, of the soil and, and just by luck, a certain percentage of it has survived. And so far we have found a percentage of that survival. But out there are more. You know, there'll be other, there'll be other survivors, if that's the right word, from the past out there still waiting to be found. Other time travellers, for certain. And the next housing development or the next, you know, HS2, that's going ahead. That's going to cut a great swathe through the landscape. Uh, there's already been archaeological work done in advance of it. And, you know, every time you put a shovel in the ground, in a green field, there's a possibility that you'll find the next wondrous treasure from a hundred years ago, or a thousand years ago, or five thousand years ago, it's still there. What's it like for an archaeologist to discover something like this? These would be life-changing. You know, that's a life-changing discovery. For an archaeologist, for somebody who cares about, is interested in, is passionate about the past, to be on site when something like the Amesbury Archer comes back into the light for the first time in all those thousands of years, that's it change your life. You know, I've had close contact with the Ness of Brodgar on Orkney over the years. I've visited the excavation uh, in action, oh, half a dozen times. And I've done a little bit of digging, you know, I've done a little bit of scraping and shoveling and whatever. Um, and to be in the presence of uh, the Ness of Brodgar is, is life-changing for someone like me. You know, different people are fired up and inspired by different things. But to see the Neolithic thinking that you see at the Nessa Brodger uh, is unforgettable. And likewise, the people that were there when the Amesbury Archer was laid bare for the first time in all of that time. You never forget that. A rich land, prized by the people who lived there, protected from the sea with constant vigilance and dikes. Ancient wooden walkways around 4,000 years old, rising sea levels, mammoth floods, swirling myths and legends, and the creation of the Welsh Atlantis. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles, To ensure you get each new episode of this podcast as it goes live, don't forget to subscribe. Write a review maybe, share it with your friends. You can follow in my footsteps as my journey unfolds across these aisles of ours by going to my podcast's Instagram account, Neil Oliver Love Letter, and seeing the places I've chosen. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie 
Additional research was by Oscar, Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance was looked after by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios. The photography is the work of Neil R. The graphics, the work of Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production.